going to talk today about epilepsy, which is one of the most misunderstood conditions in medical science. Its official definition is uh, that of recurrent spontaneous seizures. And a seizure is a transient disorder, signs and symptoms, due to abnormal or excessive synchronous electrical activity in the brain. In other words, it's an electrical storm in the brain. This word seized has been connoted to be seized over the centuries by supernatural forces, either the gods or the devils. The word seized in Greek means to be taken hold. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Of course, epilepsy is nothing more and nothing less than a medical disorder, just like multiple sclerosis or muscular dystrophy, and yet it carries all this stigma, all this baggage. What epilepsy is not, it's not mental retardation, it's not alcoholism, it's not psychosis, violence, criminal, or contagious. It is, however, common. It's, in fact, the most prevalent serious neurological illness able to affect people of all ages, from the young to the old. And the condition of status epilepticus, which is not ordinary seizures, but seizures that go on for more than half an hour without stopping, claim from 10,000 to 30,000 lives per year either the seizure or the underlying condition causing the seizure. Epilepsy has onset peaks in the young and the old, and should you be fortunate enough to live to age 75, which I hope most of you will be, you will have a 10% chance of having at least one seizure in your life. This is a common condition. Because of the stigma, people do not wear it on their sleeve for everyone to notice. Many famous people are said to have epilepsy. Of course, how can we really know about some of these? It's an interesting list with a story behind each one. But about 1% of the world's population has epilepsy. It occurs in US Supreme Court justices, and perhaps of more interest to those of us here at Stanford, it occurs in Stanford quarterbacks who just had a seizure a couple of days ago, the first one, and therefore will be missing the Saturday game with USC, which I'm sure we would have won. <laughs> so epilepsy is far from being a solved problem. Those people with seizures who respond to old time existing medications are about one out of two. Then those who are responding to new medications, and there are new ones coming all the time, is about 10%. About 5% of people are candidates for brain surgery to attempt to cure the epilepsy, to remove the seizure focus, the part of the brain from which seizures come. I'll say more about that in a little bit. And then about a third remain uncontrolled no matter what we do. The hope for this third who is uncontrolled is research is development of new and better methods to treat seizures, and we are trying all the time. Considering that one-third who are not controlled, it is a very large number because of the high prevalence of epilepsy. So it is a greater number than people with all brain tumors, primary and metastatic, plus all multiple sclerosis, plus all muscular dystrophy, plus all Guillain-Barre, plus all Lou Gehrig disease, put together. It is a group in substantial need. Life is no fun with uncontrolled seizures or substantial toxicity from seizure medications. Those who are not controlled or who are not feeling well on their medications, those who have a poor quality of life because of seizures, should be evaluated at a comprehensive epilepsy center where there can be outpatient clinic evaluations, various tests, if necessary, hospital admissions to control the seizures, video EEG monitoring, sometimes for that approximate 5% epilepsy surgery, psychosocial support, 
and neuropsychological testing, and education and research. Uh, most big cities do have one or two comprehensive epilepsy centers uh, these days. Stanford certainly uh, has been one for a long time. Now, uh, we go to a little about what I teach my medical students and my residents. When I see a new patient in clinic or in the hospital who might have epilepsy, I go through a series of logical steps. The first one is to consider whether a person is in fact having a seizure because everything that goes bump in the night or the day is not necessarily a seizure. We'll do these points one by one. There are many imitators of epilepsy. Some of them are medical, some of them are neurological, and some are psychological. Fainting spells, which medically are called syncope, can drop a person to the ground and look like seizures, as can heart irregularities, low blood sugar, low oxygen, mini strokes, migraine with confusional episodes. Migraine is not just a headache. Sleep disorders such as narcolepsy, people who fall asleep appropriately, inappropriately, may be thought to have seizures. Dizziness, movement disorders such as tremor, tic, dystonia, which are abnormal posturing, have been confused with seizures. And then a variety of psychological events can look like seizures, including those called pseudo-seizures or non-epileptic seizures, which are in my view, a type of cry for help, not faking a seizure, but stress producing something that looks very much like a seizure. I've had people who've come to me for epilepsy surgery after years of uncontrolled epilepsy who have never had epilepsy at all, but have had one of the imitators. In medicine, it's always good to start with a proper diagnosis. And the diagnosis in epilepsy is not high tech. It's to start with a good story for something that sounds like seizures, an alteration of sensory or motor function, behavior or consciousness, punched out in time with a clear start and a clear finish, a time course lasting five seconds to five minutes, reasonably stereotyped, meaning the same from event to event, rarely triggered. If Johnny has a seizure every time his brother Jimmy grabs his toy, it's not epilepsy. It's a behavioral <laughs> event. Although some seizures can be triggered by some things. Flashing lights, uh, for example, can trigger seizures. And it is then not one of the imitators of epilepsy that I just mentioned. The physical exam, which is so important in most parts of medicine and in neurology in general, is important but relatively less important in the diagnosis of epilepsy because epilepsy is so much into the story. I argued to my medical students that the most important tool that they have to examine people with epilepsy is the telephone, so they can call someone who's actually seen the episode and get a good description. Occasionally, something shows up on the physical examination that points to a part of the brain that's injured, a toxicity of medication, or a clue to some genetic or hereditary disease that might be causing seizures. But it's not as important as the history. Among tests, the most important test is the EEG, electroencephalogram, brain waves. When we do an EEG on someone, we look for spikes. These are spikes, and the way we lay out the wires on the head according to standard nomenclature, with odds on the left and evens on the right, this is on the right side of the brain. This whole screen is 10 seconds in time for brain voltage, brain electricity, and these are so brief that the person would not feel them, but they reflect synchronous abnormal firing of the neurons for a fraction of a second, and they mark a part of the brain that might give rise to seizures. Now, if those spikes or abnormal brain rhythms persisted for a longer period of time, such as we see here going on for about five seconds or more, then the person would have symptoms and they would start to have what visibly would be a seizure. The nature of the seizure would depend upon where in the brain the abnormal electricity was. If it occurred in a motor area controlling the right arm, there might be twitching of the right arm. If it occurred in visual cortex, there would be visions, seeing things. If it occurred in parts of the brain that had to do with memory, there would be confusion or sometimes strange forced abnormal uh, memory, and that part of the brain 
is linked to emotionality as well. So you can imagine when someone has unexplained, spontaneous emotional sensations and forced memories, how in old years when epilepsy wasn't understood, how some of these folks would get locked up in a mental institution for their seizures. Still probably happens today, although thankfully not as much. We can study these seizures in an epilepsy monitoring unit, video EEG unit, where we look at the image of the event and correlate it with the brainwave uh, activity. It sometimes helps us to make a diagnosis where one was just not clear from the description. So epilepsy or an imitator. And then the next question is, if a seizure, what type? There is a complex tree of different types of seizures, but the main branch are those that start partially, which is a synonym for focally, in one part of the brain. And you will see this as starting in one part of the body. The generalized seizures start all over. If we're looking at the brainwave pattern, it lights up like a Christmas tree, right and left, front and back, and the body is moving and stiff all over. And typically, there would be unconsciousness from the beginning. In these, there might be time to get a warning, which is called an aura, whereas generalized seizures, it's typically out like a light. Now, if we look at the next division, among the partial seizures, they are simple and complex. Complex doesn't mean complicated. It means there is loss of consciousness, awareness, or memory. If a person becomes confused with a partial seizure, it's a complex partial seizure. If the person is saying, Doc, my hand's twitching. It's been doing this for a couple of hours. It's annoying. Can you get it stopped? That is a simple partial seizure. There's no alteration of awareness. Any seizure that starts partially or focally can spread to the entire brain, and then it becomes generalized. If you have a seizure deep in the temporal lobe, one of the four lobes of the brain and the most seizure-prone part of the brain, when the seizure starts and is localized to the temporal lobe, a person might just feel funny feelings, deja vu, I've been here before, odd memories, odd emotionalities, um, even GI sensations, nausea, rising sensations. These are common focal seizure symptoms in the temporal lobe. Then if the abnormal synchronous electricity spreads to both temporal lobes, at that point, there's no ability to register memory. And there's a dreamlike state. There's a robot-like performance living in an odd world that must be second to second in duration. If the activity spreads to the entire brain, including the motor centers, then there is a full shaking generalized seizure. And I will, in a few moments, show you some of those to make that clearer. There are other generalized seizure types besides the full grand mal, tonic meaning stiffening and clonic meaning jerking. There's the petty mal, which is now called absence, since it's just a brief staring spell or interruption, but it involves activity in much of the brain. There's a myoclonic seizure, which is a sudden jerk or a sudden twitch. Myo means muscle, clonic means jerk. Very brief seizure, but generalized. And atonic is a loss of tone, a sudden drop. What uh, one of my uh, Baltimore patients uh, back in my Johns Hopkins days once called um, the atomic seizures. Doc, I think I had another one of them atomic seizures. And it seems like that because you can hit the ground very hard with an atonic seizure. So let's see if I can now show you some of these seizures. And I emphasize two things. One is all of these are with permission to be shown in public. And second is seizures can be upsetting to watch, but I think it's important to see the nature of the beast, what we're fighting. First would be the simple partial seizure. (laughs) 
lot of shaking, but he's with it enough to hit the button to call the nurse and mark the seizure. He can respond and answer. He's fully with it. Simple partial seizure. He had surgery on the small area of the brain, and his seizures are now gone. Notice the hand. That's called an automatism. Automatism, automatic activity. She worked in a uh, care home for the elderly, and while she was putting on an apron around an 80-year-old woman, she had a seizure, and she was struggling and pulling on the apron. Those in the nursing home thought she was somehow attacking this old woman. So they shouted to her, but she didn't hear. She was in the middle of a complex partial seizure, confused. She didn't really hurt the old woman, just scared her. The other people tackled her, charged her with elder abuse, and due to some miscarriage of justice, uh, which happened long before I met her, the judge would not allow evidence into court, and she ended up serving time in jail for this, uh, this event. Just another example of how understood, misunderstood epilepsy can be. This next seizure is a little upsetting to watch. That was a tonic-clonic seizure, the most violent form of the seizure. Here this teenager is playing a video game and comes the brain discharge. He stops pushing the buttons, head nodding a little bit. You can see the high voltage storm. That was a petit mal seizure or an absence seizure. atonic seizure. She would have been on the ground had she been standing from that seizure. Those are the main seizure types. There are others and there are many, many variants. In fact, no two people have exactly the same type of seizure because no two people have exactly the same type of brain. But seeing some of these can give you some idea how upsetting seizures can be. It's been my experience vicariously, because I've never personally had a seizure, that family members often find the seizures more difficult. Some of this room may know this much better than I do, because the person having the seizure sometimes is out of it and doesn't really know, except confusion and soreness and embarrassment afterwards. But the first times people see a family member, their child, husband, anyone, having a seizure, it's hard to believe sometimes that they're not dying. But they're not. A seizure rarely harms the brain and rarely causes death. I can't say never. You can crash a car or fall down a flight of stairs or have a heart attack during a seizure. But as violent as it looks, it's actually much less damaging to the brain than, say, a quiet stroke is, where part of the brain dies. So we classify the seizures, because 
classification tells us how best to treat and how best to work them up further. We rule out serious causes. Only about half of the time can we find a cause for the seizures. As our neuroimaging is getting better, it's getting higher. It might be 60% now, whereas it was 30, 40 when I started training. And soon it will be 90, 95. But some of the injuries to the brain that cause seizures are microscopic, and we just can't see them. That virus that got in when you had a headache and a bad flu and couldn't think may have left a scar. The head trauma that you didn't think was significant might have been. Or a genetic condition that's changed the chemistry of the brain, which we have no way yet to image, is causing the imbalance between excitation and inhibition. So we look, and MRI, which is a brain imaging technique, is the most serious way to tell whether there is a structural problem or whether it's likely a genetic, meaning a chemical cause, because seizures can be caused either by nature or by nurture. The causes are different in different ages. I'll let you look at that list. I won't read them all. Idiopathic means cause unknown, although it's also been suggested that it means doctor is an idiot and the patient is pathetic. <laughs> this MRI shows a common cause in society, which is head trauma causing seizures, with a scarring in the frontal lobe where there was a coup, contra coup, where the frontal lobes bumped against the inside of the skull with trauma. This is the signature injury of the Iraq war, and there are more and more people who are going to have seizures coming back from Iraq with head trauma. Here's evidence of an old stroke. Strokes can cause seizures. Here's a blood clot, a hematoma, pressing on the brain. That can cause seizures. Here is an abnormal blood vessel called a cavernous angioma, a little raspberry-like varicose vessel in the brain. Here's a brain abscess, an infection in the brain. Here's something that many of you may not have heard of, but it's an important cause of seizures, a dysplasia. It is, brain, it is a nest of brain cells that during development got off at the wrong elevator stop. They were supposed to migrate all the way from the fluid-filled ventricles to out here where you see this gray rim of cortex, but they in fact stayed deep in the brain and brain cells in the wrong location are prone to cause seizures. Here is what everybody fears when they first have a seizure. Fortunately, it's rare and that is a brain tumor causing seizures, a glioblastoma multiforme, in this case a malignant brain tumor, but benign brain tumors uh, also cause uh, seizures. So uh, should, should someone you know have a seizure, it's a relatively small likelihood that, it's not a, that it is a brain tumor. It probably isn't. And even if it is a brain tumor, most of the time it's not a malignancy. So, I want to be careful not to scare the public into thinking seizure brain tumor. It's not the usual link. The next task that we have in the clinic is to choose a suitable medicine. We have about 20 medicines available. They have different profiles of side effects. Some people tolerate certain types of side effects better than others. And some seizure medicines work a little bit, bit better for different seizure types. How can we pick our pills? This is one method. This is the unblinded, single-tailed uh, method, statistically, of uh, picking pills. This is uh, from an old issue of the uh, Stanford Magazine. We have, in fact, a long history of medications for epilepsy. Starting back in the 1850s, the first effective medication was bromides. Bromides came in at a time when it was thought that epilepsy was a form of insanity and insanity derived from abnormal sexual drive. So bromides and saltpeter were used to reduce the sexual drive, and saltpeter didn't do much, but the bromides actually turned out to be useful for treating epilepsy. And since there are so few children, I think, who watch this program on cable TV late at night, I will mention that the physician who 
did this research in 1850 had the unfortunate name of Sir Charles Lowcock. That's his name. Then, in 1912, came in phenobarbital, which was introduced as a long-acting sleeping pill and also turned out to be useful for seizures. But it makes you sleepy, and it has a significant incidence of depression among people. And it's considered in the United States and most developed countries to be a somewhat outdated medication now. Yet, it is the only medication that can be afforded in the developing world where 70 to 80 percent of the people with epilepsy can't get any medication at all. So we are in the United States arguing over subtleties in our clinic of which of the 20 medicines to use. But sadly, in most of the world, not possible for them to get any medications. Phenytoin or Dilantin is a medicine that was discovered by research into brain mechanisms and has led to many others that I won't mention by name. Here's the era we are in right now. And here are medications on the launching pad. So the length of this list, highlighted by three that I think will come out within the next year, is a little bit of a beacon of hope that the research community and the pharmaceutical industry has not given up on looking for epilepsy medications. Because even though two out of three people are satisfied with their medicines, as I say, one out of three, a very large number, are not. And better treatments are needed. So there will be better treatments. I'm familiar with most of these drugs, at least in prototype form. And there is no magic bullet in that list that's going to displace all of the other medicines. But having more of a choice of medicines is going to be useful. What we ultimately want is not a medicine to suppress seizures by making brain cells fire less quickly. We would like a medicine to cure epilepsy so that people could take it, like they take an antibiotic for pneumonia, and then not have pneumonia. Most of the time, you don't have to keep taking an anti-pneumonia pill. That's one of the holy grails in epilepsy, is to learn what we can do to prevent or cure the epilepsy medically, instead of just giving a medication every day of a person's life to suppress the seizures and make them suffer whatever side effects occur as a consequence of those seizures. Much of what I do in clinic is balance seizures and side effects. If people are still having a lot of seizures and few side effects, we'll increase medicine. If seizures are controlled and there are side effects, will go the other way and will decrease medications. All too often, at least in referral practices, there are both side effects and seizures. And then we need to consider another strategy, change medicines, streamline. Often people accumulate many, many medicines uh, all at once. Or we need to consider the non-medical therapy. We want to have complete seizure control with minimal or no toxicity. And in my view, many physicians set the bar too low. A person will come in and say, uh, I've had three seizures this month. And the doc will say, well, did you fall and hurt yourself? And I say, no, not really. And I say, well, that's pretty good then. Let's just renew what you have. It shouldn't be that way. The goal should be no seizures and no side effects. It may not always be possible to get there, but we should never be satisfied until we at least know that we're trying. We should consider non-medical therapies as well as the usual medicines. Um, non-medical therapies are several. They can be brain surgery. They can be a special diet, one in particular called the ketogenic diet. It's an interesting diet. It uh, derived from attempts to cure epilepsy around 1900 by fasting and prayer. And I shan't speak to whether or not the prayer worked, but the fasting worked. It's just that you can't fast for the rest of your life. Well, you can, but it would be a reasonably short life. 
Then in the Mayo Clinic in the 1930s, it was discovered that it was not necessary to fast. It was just necessary to eliminate carbohydrates, eat a very high protein and a high fat diet, and generate ketone bodies to force the brain to rely on a ketone as an energy supply instead of on glucose. And that changed the chemistry of the brain in a way that made it hard to have seizures. So it worked. It wasn't a miracle, but it stopped seizures in some people. Then comes Dilantin and Tegretol and Depakote and so on, all the new seizure medications which grabbed our attentions and affections. And the ketogenic diet fell by the wayside for about 30 years until my mentor, Dr. John Freeman at uh, Johns Hopkins, together with a few colleagues, tried it again in some kids for whom nothing else was working and brought it back into play again. So it is a, a very serious option, but for the most part, it's not a cure of epilepsy. And it is a high-fat diet, so it can have some health consequences. It's very much like the Atkins diet, if any of you have heard about that, uh, but uh, only more so. Electrical brain stimulation is a new treatment for epilepsy, which is still being tested in some regards. Uh, one aspect of it, the vagus nerve stimulator, is in use to stimulate a nerve in the neck that changes brain activity in a way that reduces seizures. And we are currently testing ways of stimulating in the brain itself to try to stop seizures. Can we uh, make some progress in this direction? I'll come back to this point in a few moments. Uh, biofeedback, relaxation uh, therapy, trying to train yourself uh, with EEG machines or something else to recognize brain waves and relax yourself out of seizures. A few people can do it. And then alternative therapies as well. You know, this is California in which I'm speaking now. And it's been estimated that at least a third of the people who come to our clinics are taking some type of alternative therapy. They may not tell their physician about them unless we ask. And it is important to ask because some of the alternative therapies, whether they work or not, are drugs. And we'll have drug interactions with the other medications. So I do encourage my patients to tell me about the alternative therapies. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't often tell them to what extent they are effective or dangerous because data often are lacking. Let me move now to epilepsy surgery. This was perhaps one of the first epilepsy surgeries done. This is a treffen hole in a skull, estimated to be uh, 100,000 years old in a museum in Berlin. When I showed this at one talk, someone in the audience asked me if the surgery worked. And I was able to say this patient has not had a seizure for 100,000 years, which is much more effective than anything I've done in clinic. These were made to let demons out of the head. And of course, they're not effective for epilepsy. This is the largest operation that you will ever, seen, ever see for epilepsy. This is a hemispherectomy, which means that approximately half of the brain is removed to stop seizures. It's an operation that is quite effective if someone has a very damaged half of the brain that's causing nothing but trouble. But you can imagine that we don't do it too often. I recall one circumstance where we requested permission, insurance clearance, for a hemispherectomy. And the insurance company came back with a letter saying that they were going to give permission, but they wanted us to know up front that they were only going to approve one for this patient. <laughs> they didn't want us coming back asking for another one if this one didn't work. <laughs> Most operations are much more limited. You can see the thumb tip. This is a partial temporal lobectomy. The temporal lobes on the side of the brain are the most seizure-prone part of the brain. And this is the site which is most often operated on to cure epilepsy a piece removed about like that, which has deep structures that are very prone to seizures, including the amygdala, Greek for almond, and hippocampus, Greek for seahorse, which it rather looks like in anatomical cross-section. 
But hippocampus is very much involved in memory processes. Amygdala is very much involved in emotionality. So you can imagine there would be some price to be paid for taking these structures out. Although if your hippocampus and amygdala and surrounding structures are damaged, not working, giving rise to seizures that are invading the adjacent healthy brain, many people feel better, smarter, sharper after those are gone and the seizures are gone. And then in addition, there's the added bonus with seizure control, it's possible to reduce medications, which also makes some people feel quite a bit smarter, if it works. Seizures in other areas of brain, critical regions for motor, skin sensation, talking, comprehension, vision, were much less likely to want to go in and operate to treat seizures in those regions. So seizure surgery is a good thing if it can't be controlled by medicines, your quality of life is being ruined by your seizures, because some people don't mind them that much, and then it doesn't make sense to take the risk of surgery. And if your seizures all come from one part of the brain, which is safe for us to remove. Somewhere, someday, someone said we only use 10% of our brain. That seems ridiculous to me, although I do have days where I feel that's true. But in general, I think all of us are using all of our brain for something. However, we know from quite a few years of experience, there are some parts of it we can safely remove, and there are other parts we best keep our cotton-picking hands uh, off of. And we usually know what those, what those are. So when people have intractable, uncontrolled seizures, our hope is that their seizures come from one place and that that is accessible, which might make them a good surgical candidate. Still, being a good surgical candidate does not mean you have to have surgery. It's elective surgery to control the epilepsy. When the seizures appear to be coming very close to a critical area of the brain, for example, let's take this as a speech comprehension area, which it is roughly in most people, on the left side if you're a right-hander, and the seizures are somewhere around here, we need to give the surgeon what I semi-facetiously call a cut-along-the-dotted-line approach. And we have to do brain mapping in order to know how to do that in that individual's uh, case, which means in an ancillary surgical procedure done under anesthesia, we will put a grid of electrodes on or under the brain with these little contact points for recording. Those will record the seizures very close up and personal, but they also will allow us to do little five-second buzzes of electrical stimulation to see if it interrupts talking or wiggling the fingers or any other cortical function that we wish to, to map. Here's how a real grid looks on a real brain. And that grid will let us draw the map to say it's safe to go here, it's important to go here, but you must keep away from this area. On the second operation, when the grid is taken out, usually about a week after the first, the brain involved in giving rise to the seizures, as much as has been mapped to be safe, is also taken out. Now, most people with epilepsy don't need surgery, and most people with epilepsy surgery don't need grid mapping, but it is something that is available and allows us to do surgery when we otherwise couldn't. I wish I could tell you that epilepsy surgery cured 99% of people, but it seems to cure about 58% of people. However, continuation of medication therapy is down there much lower at 8%. And in one randomized trial for a year, comparing surgery to medical therapy for treating epilepsy, there was only one death, and it was sad to say in the medical group, not in the surgical group. New things are coming out. Stereotactic radio surgery for epilepsy. This is a cyber knife, basically invented uh, here at Stanford by Dr. John Adler and others. A computer-controlled radiation beam that swings around the head according to targets that an operator entered on a patient's MRI scan. It's uh, surgery without even cutting the hair, much less the, the skin or the bone. There's vagus nerve stimulation, an electrical 
type of stimulation device that's put in the chest and wrapped around a nerve in the neck. That nerve feeds into the brain stem and changes the electrical activity in a way in which it's harder to have a seizure. It sounds Buck Rogers, but it works. This one's been tested, found effective many times in controlled trials. It's approved by insurance companies. And uh, we use it. We just don't use it in everyone because it's more likely to be partially effective, just an amelioration of the seizures rather than a cure of the seizures. But it is safe. It's safer than brain surgery. We are putting stimulating electrodes directly into people's brains. I'm involved in a protocol testing brain stimulation in a deep structure here called the thalamus, and you can see four electrical contacts uh, in the thalamus. A company in Mountain View called Neuropace is developing electronic chips to be implanted into a false skull that they make for a person with these electronic devices built directly in, so nothing's detectable. And these devices will sense when a seizure is coming by measuring the electricity of the brain continually, having a programmable computer chip, and giving a countershock to stop the seizure as it occurs. It's being tested. The vagus nerve stimulator exists. It's an approved and insurance paid device. These deep brain stimulators are currently under testing. And within the next year, we'll be able to tell you whether they work. If they don't, I expect there'll be some variations of them that will be tried, which next will work. So last but not least is helping the patient and the family with the psychosocial issues. My young students are concerned about seizure control. My better and more experienced students are concerned with quality of life. Some seizures ruin your quality of life. Other seizures aren't that bad, and it's actually the treatments for them that are ruining the quality of life. So this is the key thing. You have to treat the person, not the seizures. You have to consider issues of school, employment, marriage, having kids for women who have epilepsy, restrictions that exist on such things as driving and sports and activities. In the work arena, it is illegal to discriminate against people with epilepsy or any disability. But it's done all the time, and it's very hard to prove. Sure, there are some things that people with epilepsy can't do. They can't be airline pilots, and that's reasonable. But to let them go as a clerk of some type or a salesperson because it's upsetting for customers to see them have a seizure, that's not reasonable. So there is considerable job place discrimination, and it is misplaced. People who have uncontrolled seizures should not drive. This is a real car from a real patient with a real seizure. But people whose seizures are controlled may be allowed to drive. And every state regulates this separately in the United States, typically requiring either three, six, or 12 months seizure-free before someone uh, can drive uh, after a seizure. I'll close with. Uh, some old remedies from epilepsy, for epilepsy, uh, from a book by uh, Temkin called On the Falling Sickness, Lichen of Horses, whatever that is, genitals of seals, hippopotamus testicles, which are not something I would like to harvest, blood of the tortoise, discarded skin of the lizard, feces of the crocodile, and fairly hard to obtain now blood of a recently stabbed gladiator. It is my hope that the treatments that I've been talking to you about tonight will not appear on somebody else's version of this slide 50 years from now. One of the keys, as I said earlier, for solving the problem of uncontrolled epilepsy is research. Research takes support. It takes funding. The funding engine has been, for the most part, the National Institute of Health and to a lesser extent, various foundations. These days, only 8 or 9% of the worthy 
research applications are being funded compared with 30, 35 percent or so just a few years ago because federal monies are going <laughs> elsewhere. So if any of you who are listening know any way to improve funding for research in epilepsy, a condition which is so much more common than, say, muscular dystrophy, but which has no Jerry Lewis, which has no way to raise money, like muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis do, then those of us who labor in the field would be very grateful. And I will leave you with my favorite fortune cookie of all time. Money spent on the brain is never spent in vain from Uncle Lee's house of Szechuan in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you very much. We can put the lights on. The question is, are people still putting tongue blades when people have seizures? I hope not, because that's not the right thing to do. The correct first aid for a seizure involves uh, just keeping somebody safe so they don't bang against things. It's fine to put a coat under the head. We recommend turning someone on their side so the saliva doesn't run down into the lungs and give what's called an aspiration pneumonia. Put nothing in the mouth. It's too likely that you'll break the person's teeth or have them inhale it and choke or get bitten. There have been too many mishaps. Only if you are a paramedic who knows how to use a soft oral airway and has one present. Otherwise, nothing in the mouth. And then look at your watch. A minute seems like an hour when you're watching someone have a seizure. If a seizure goes on for longer than five minutes, not counting the wake-up time, then call 911. So the question is about an 89-year-old father who had a complex partial seizure that went on for an unusually long time. And I'm not sure if it was one continuous seizure or one seizure that stopped and then went into another one without full recovery. But yes, that would be a situation that should be treated in a, in a hospital and with some intensity. It probably didn't harm the brain because it was partial and not as widespread as a grand mal seizure, although some people are rather confused for a while after a seizure that goes on that long and it takes a recovery stage. It makes the point, too, that epilepsy is not just something that happens in kids. It happens to people of any age, and in fact, among seniors, there's a second peak in incidence that occurs where it's very common for someone 75, 78 years old, never had a seizure before, here one comes for the first time. The question is, how is, when I say a seizure is not harming the brain, how is it affecting the brain? It's making brain cells all fire at once in an abnormal synchronous activity. The normal activity of the brain involves a lot of independent chatter between just a few brain cells. It's uh, the analogy of a, sport, a sports uh, stadium before the team comes, when everybody's talking with their neighbors. That's normal brain activity. The seizure is the wave or the cheer uh, after a touchdown, where it's almost impossible to do anything else because of that synchronous activity. But when the activity passes, the nerve cells go back to doing their own actions again. If the brain exhausts its energy, or if people seem to be turning blue and not breathing well during a seizure, the seizure usually dies down because seizures require a lot of oxygen to keep going, and then the automatic brainstem breathing reflexes take over again. People usually survive seizures very well. The most practical problem that I've seen is much more subtle, and I'm not sure it's what you were asking, but it is something that happens. I'm pretty convinced that people who have uncontrolled seizures for years get worse and worse memory. And the memory isn't losing chunks of their past, because their distant past is usually well remembered. It's what they had for lunch that they can't remember. Memory gets worse. Is there a link between migraines, such as ocular migraine, which would be eye migraine and epilepsy? They're two separate conditions. The most common link is that both common, and some people are unfortunate to have both. The next most common link is that after a seizure, a lot of people get migraine headaches. And the third link, which is extremely rare, I see it 
just a couple of times a year in an epilepsy practice is someone who has migraines so bad that it actually provokes an epileptic seizure. That's the rarest. Is there any connection between seizures and sleepwalking? Sleepwalking is a sleep disorder, which is not seizures. So it would be one of the imitators of epilepsy. And uh, the place where it might become confused is if somebody had a complex partial seizure during sleep and then was, in the aftermath of the seizure, befuddled, might wander around without knowing what's going, going on. But you'd be able to tell that, because that would be a person who would stay confused and couldn't be woken up out of it until time had passed. But no, sleepwalking is different from seizures, except as one of the imitators to confuse with it. Yeah, so these, these are two interesting scientific questions that we could talk about a long time. I'll give the short answer. A uh, question was made about kindling. Kindling is a laboratory model of epilepsy by which brain stimulation is given day after day and eventually produces a seizure focus. So that part of the brain has maladaptively learned to have seizures. It's used in a laboratory to make models to study epilepsy. It's been a debate among epilepsy specialists as to whether or not it happens in people. Probably can happen probably doesn't happen very often, or epilepsy surgery wouldn't ever work because the seizure focus that we take out to cure the epilepsy would, over the years, have kindled foci in other parts of the brain that would live on, uh, on their own. And that usually does not uh, happen. Your second question was about brain cells constantly uh, dying and renewing themselves. How I wish that were so. For the most part, you have all the brain cells you're going to have when you're born, and you just lose them. But there are two slightly hopeful statements against that bleak background. One is there are, are a few places in brain, and hippocampus is one, that can make some new brain cells. This is new evidence. Second is the real business of the brain is not done at the brain cell, but at the trillions and trillions of synapses, which are the connections among the brain cells. And you can make new synapses, new connections, until the day you die at 99 years old. So yes, it is possible that the brain could reorganize to work its way around a seizure. And there have been many cases that I have seen in my, in my practice where seizures have improved because of Nothing that I or any of the other doctors have done or even stopped for a time. We always hold that out as a possibility. Yes? So could, could seizures affecting the memory either during a seizure where the memory is terrible or in the wake of a seizure where the memory may be poor for many days or even chronically, as I say, the seizures can affect the memory, can that be confused with dementia? Yes, it can. And most experienced neurologists uh, give a thought to someone, especially if a seeming dementia is pretty recent and pretty acute as to whether it could be an other neurological condition of which a seizure would be one. Question of uh, pregnancy in women with epilepsy and the medications. All of the seizure medications are potential teratogenic drugs. The baseline birth defect rate in the United States for any woman is about 1 to 2 percent. For women with epilepsy on seizure medicines, it's between 5 and 10 percent. So the risk is higher. But if you want to be a glass half full type, you can say there's still more than a 90 percent chance of having a normal baby even with the higher risk. It seems that the risk is due to the seizure medication, not just the epilepsy. Because these drugs are used for a lot of other conditions besides epilepsy. And when they are, studies have shown that there are birth defect risks there as well. So why don't we just stop all the medications when a woman becomes pregnant or might become pregnant? Because if the seizures take over to a certain level, grand mal seizures and so on, it's dangerous both for the mother and the baby. So we try to use the fewest number of medications in the lowest possible dose that will likely control the seizures. Some medications seem better than others or worse than others. There seem to be, for example, according to the pregnancy registries, in preliminary data, more birth defects on 
valproic acid, which is Depakote, or phenobarbital than some of the newer medications. You mentioned breastfeeding. The seizure medicines do come out in the breast milk, but we think that the benefits of breastfeeding outweighs that, and we figure the kid's been exposed to those medicines in the placental bloodstream for nine months beforehand, so might as well do the breastfeeding. How update? Depakote's still a very used and very valuable treatment for, uh, for epilepsy. It's, uh, it's one of the most powerful, perhaps the most powerful, medicine against certain types of generalized seizures. Um, as I just mentioned, I don't like to use it in women who are or may become pregnant, but I use plenty of it in, uh, in my practice for generalized seizures. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. There, there are a lot of studies and a lot of experience that seizure medications, which slow brain cell firing and cool the brain down, have a downward effect on cognition and memory in a lot of people. Not all of them, but in a lot. Some med medicines are worse than others in that regard. Uh, for example, uh, phenobarbital is much more mind dulling than most of the newer medications. In all cases in adults that I know of, when the medication is stopped, people go back to their normal cognition and intelligence. It can be a different story if the medication is given either to a pregnant mother or a very young baby during the developing, the rapidly developing time of the brain. There, there has been evidence, for example, a Farwell study in the New England Journal that the IQ can be permanently lowered by certain seizure medicines in the first few years of life. But for adults, the expectation is that you go back, you go back to normal when the medicines stop. I think, speaking of stopping, I think I'm um, getting the sign that uh, we're out of time and have to stop, but I'd be happy to hang around and answer questions individually afterwards. Thank you very much.